when I was channeling alchemy, and I thought I was really going to fall apart during that. I really did. And I didn't. I thought that book should probably be printed with a warning on the cover. Like, if you do this work, you know, you may have to encounter your darkest crap. But on the other side of that was something extraordinary, which is the life I'm living now, which I would not have gotten because I was so busy being afraid all the time that I didn't know that I could have another life, you know? And I didn't even know that I was that afraid because it was just what I knew and it was my normal. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Paul Selig, who's been on my podcast many times, he's a channel who receives information from a collective he calls the guides. When the guides come through, he mumbles the words that the guides speak and then speaks them in his own voice to share the information that they have. And really a lot of the information that's coming through, it just checks out. It feels true in every cell of my body and really expresses a lot of the truth about the mystical nature of Christ consciousness and the way that we can actually see the world as the kingdom of heaven, as it really is. So he's one of the most profound spiritual teachers. He also has an ability to tap into people. And during this podcast, you'll see him tap in and do some readings on me. It's always a very personal and powerful experience when I get to both talk to Paul, my friend, and to receive the wisdom of the guides. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast with Paul Selig. Paul, my brother, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Yeah. So I'll just tell you and tell the audience, this has been a, been a tough week for me. Um, my friend, Stephen Twitch boss, um, passed from an apparent suicide and it's just, it's been really devastating to, uh, to feel that. And, um, you know, and, and I, and I will say it's, it's been interesting. I've, uh, I've felt like it's been <clears throat> oftentimes available to me to be able to at least feel and can connect with, even if it's just my imagination, the, the spirit or the or the voice of of someone who's passed you know recently my another brother parker passed mm -hmm. and it's uh it's been very hard for me to make this connection in uh, in this instance and mm -hmm. um i guess i i guess i would just just want to since since you may be more versed in this is there is there a potentially a confusion or depending on how the passing was because Parker's passing, although tragic and accidental, there was like a, a long moments where he got to love his family and know what mm -hmm. was coming and make the decision. And it was almost like his, his voice, just call it his voice, you know, cause mm -hmm. I don't want to posit anything else, but his voice was really accessible to me and it felt like mm -hmm. him. And in this mm -hmm. case, um, whatever happened with, with Twitch and, you know, it, it feels like it's not accessible. And is, is this, is this like a phenomenon in which potentially the, the, the soul or the voice could be confused or, or, or something else could be happening? Oh, well, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a spiritual medium, so I'm not, I don't talk to people that have passed. Right. I usually get them when they still have a body and I can sometimes get them right up until the moment where they cross, which is really something to experience. But when you were saying that, I just kept hearing it's not time yet. So it's just yeah. not time yet. I mean, I, I understand or I've been told that, you know, when, when people cross, there is a period of acclimation that has to happen. I've had people that have crossed who've shown up. And like, I had a woman once who I was angry at, and then I heard she died. And I went, oh, well, she died. And I didn't quite know what I felt about that. And, you know, we'd had some bad stuff in the past. And as I was falling asleep that night, she showed up and she said, I'm sorry, okay? And I was surprised. Wow. And then she was off and she was a 12th stepper. And I realized she was doing her ninth step. She probably had a long list of people <laughs> to say I'm yeah. sorry to. She didn't want to carry it with her. But I do understand that when there's this kind of a crossing, you know, there's a period of acclimation. They need to be taken care of. And I hear that they're taken care of. Yeah. on the other side, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for in, indulging this, uh, this very personal, personal issue. And, and thank you to the mm -hmm. listeners for allowing me as I, as I talk to, uh, my beloved uncle Paul here, who's helped me not only with podcasts, but also in my personal life so many times. So, uh, so I'm really happy to be here. So let's get into, let's get into the latest, kind of the latest track that the guides are on. And now I know that resurrection, 
Um, it just kind of came out for, for most of us, but probably the guides have moved on significantly even since resurrection because yeah. the, the guides just don't stop. But so let's bring people, let's bring people up through kind of the general overarching, you know, themes that they're starting to explore through resurrection, even carrying in from kingdom through resurrection. And then, uh, and then maybe into a little bit where they're going now. And then I'll, I have a bunch of notes and I'll start to dive in and, and, uh, and we'll see where this takes us. Sure. Well, they've already dictated another book. It's called the book of innocence. So that's was finished in September. So the teaching really is progressing, progressing. And, you know, they're teaching, they're teaching manifestation, but I don't think that they're teaching it in a way that is, is what people expect. I mean, they really talk about how our whole reality is something that we're in vibrational accord with. You know, mm. everything we see, we're in co-resonance with. This is the reality that we're supporting, we're co-creating. And they've been teaching the upper room for a while, which they say is the level of consciousness that's above what they call the common field. It's the next octave up in terms of the music of tonality and consciousness. And what they're teaching in, in resurrection really is the realization in form of what they call the monad or the true self and what that entails. I mean, it's kind of a radical teaching, but I'll say where they're going now, um, which surprised me, is the idea that so much of the difficulty that we have individually and collectively here is that all of our memory is born in a field of separation. Like every memory I have was induced with the belief that I'm separate from source and separate from you and separate from everything, because that's how we've been operating. Well, and also not only separate from source, but which is another way of saying it, but separate from the darkness, right? Like, I think this is another key point. Like one of the first things that I have pulled out of this from resurrection, no aspect of you, even that which you think is darkest is outside of the love of God. And this exactly. reunification of the splinters or the parasitic energies must not be seen as an exorcism, but as an act of reclamation. So I think what's the reason I wanted to bring that up is of course that, and you cover this so many times, that people have this idea of God, this angelic, all the good, all the light, only that. And then there's this other part. So even if they're connecting and feel themselves connected to source, but they're ascribing only the good parts to source, then they're disconnected and splintered from all of their inner darkness. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can't, the guys say again and again, you can't be the light and hold another in darkness or hold yourself in darkness either. And that includes the aspects of self that we wish to ignore. You know, they've said for years, you know, if you've got a body buried in the basement, it's going to stink up the whole house eventually. <laughs> and so the idea is exhumation or reclamation. You've got to bring the lights to these parts of the self. So there's nothing in this teaching, I think, that could be seen as sort of bypassing. You do need to encounter these things, but you don't have to hang out there. And I think what we get to do is stop self-identifying with these aspects of ourselves that we're suppressing or denying or fearing. So when these things are brought to the light, the whole body is full of light. The whole being is full of light. And mm. I think that's the gift of this stuff. I mean, I'm experiencing it now, and I'm a little stunned by it. It's not yeah, me what too. I thought, you know? And it's, it's tremendously exciting and deeply moving. And... You know, I'm kind of going, who would have thought? I've been hearing these guides for years now, but I'm truly beginning to understand experientially the teaching, which is really the teaching of presence and being, or more so than anything else. And it's knowing the self in this larger presence, which is source. And yeah. I agree with what you said. You know, they've said in the most recent book that even our idea of God or source has still been sort of rendered through this lens of separation and is consequently tainted with fear. Yeah. And all of that stuff has to be reclaimed too. You know, you yeah. can't continue to perpetuate that and not have that experience. Yeah. I think, you know, so for me, psychedelic medicines has been a deep part of my journey for 23 years. And huh. I've had many encounters with the darkness of every variety, demonic, disgusting, 
whatever you know tricky the the trickster energy all all of the all of these energies i've encountered is elsewhere and typically loving them has been the best way but i've still yeah. even if i've loved them like i remember i encountered the world crusher demon during an ayahuasca ceremony and he was completely dominating every aspect of my being tricking me everywhere i went this is a whole long story Finally, the resolution was I floated up to his head, kissed him on the forehead, and his, his eyes turned into heart emojis, and the resolution was love. However, so I learned that lesson. I've learned that lesson for a while, love, but I still was loving something outside of myself. And then the recent challenge has been to see myself as the world crusher, as the disgusting demon, as the, as the torturer, as the sadist, as I'll see that as some aspect within the self and still love that. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's the next level is to not only love it out. Oh yeah, I love you, but just stay over there, please. You know, like I love you as long as you're over there and you're not me. But then mm -hmm. when you start to bring that in and say like, I, I am all of source and, you know, connected to all of source, uh, the monad is, you know, is, mm -hmm. is source itself. And when you start to see that and feel that that's where it gets really hard. It's, it's, because the instinct is to reject it when you actually bring it home. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, my own experience with stuff, it's not been as you say it, but I think it's probably comparable just experientially in the, in the depth of it, you know, and the, the nastiness of some of it. Right. Because, you know, it was the book of alchemy, which I was channeling on the road when I was basically falling apart. And each time they would deliver a lecture, I would think, I don't believe this. I don't know. This is going to make any sense at all to anybody. And when the lectures were were all transcribed and put into the book that they intended, it made perfect sense. But it was very much about that passage of sort of encountering these parts of ourselves that we would prefer not to look at, not to have to see. I don't know that I'm where you're at yet in terms of loving them. I move towards accepting them and not sort of lashing myself to them in my fear, you know, which is what we yeah. do. Early, it was in an old book, Book of Mastery. They said, you know, imagine you're going up a mountain and there's a cave in the mountain and the one person you never want to see again as long as you live is in that cave and you get to walk them out. And they said, you are the one that put them in darkness. That's why you get to walk them out. Who you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. What you call in darkness, including those parts of ourselves, calls us to that darkness. But that becomes the opportunity for reclamation. Mm -hmm. So bringing it to the light is liberation for that aspect of self and for me. There are people that I still don't want to bump into on the street, but I'm not, you know, tied to them anymore in the way that I was. I'm not carrying that weight as I used to. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And I, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm, it's easy for me to get to this place of love. It's very, very difficult. And, and oftentimes acceptance is just enough, not flinching in disgust, because I think there's something yeah. very, there's something very visceral about the disgust impulse, which will come up when you encounter darkness. And actually the, it has a place in our world. And so yeah. the paradox of the multidimensionality is on one level, you might be disgusted, but on as yourself, the higher self in the upper room, it's still seeing it in a different way, seeing it in a way that you can love yeah. it and yeah. still holding that paradox of, you know, some of your affirmations, you are, as I am, I cannot perceive you as outside myself because I am all things, right? Like these are the words that the guides, that the guides yeah. offer. So getting to that though, you have to go all the way through the disgust portal and, and that portal is, it's, I mean, it's, it's awful in, in many ways to experience is going through yeah. the disgust portal. It precedes the judgment in, in an interesting way like that. Like you have the disgust and then, then it actually feeds this judgment. So you have to get beyond the disgust mm -hmm. of the thing, you know, cause you even say like, you have to be able to find God in the feces as you find God in the sunset, yeah. but feces yeah. will give you a disgust impulse, yeah. which will make it hard to find God in there. And I mean, I think that some of that's because we've been taught what to be disgusted by. You know, there's yeah. this collective agreement and collective morality and collective assumption about what is good and what is not good. And, you know, and I think when I understand what the guides are trying to teach, it's that the meaning that anything has been endowed with sort of becomes the thing. You know, it becomes how we experience the thing or the uh -huh. situation or the person. 
And so we're always then operating with a sort of collective lens or frame about how things are, which we move into co-resonance with. When the guides teach this claim, behold, I make all things new, which is how the divine self, they say, or the monad perceives and what it does to manifest reality, how it lifts what it encounters, they're actually inviting us to move beyond that. And I think the challenge is some people think that means you're making it pretty or you're spraying perfume on the feces, you know, and that's yeah, not yeah. what it's about. It's about seeing it as of source without necessarily endowing it with the quality or the meaning that it's accrued over time. Yeah. I And then I, I think this is where the paradox lands, though, is that, all right, there's a reason we have a disgust impulse with yeah. feces because we're not supposed yeah. to eat it. You know, like yeah. we're not supposed to eat it. Yeah. And actually, if we do eat it, it does a lot of nasty things to our gut yeah. and our biology. So some of this is actually hardwired into the body and consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also where some of the challenge becomes of maintaining your place in the upper room is there's there's things that are hardwired into the body, yeah. into the body, the soma, you mm -hmm. know, and then, and then, so to carry both is like, is, is, is required. And it's the necessity to be able to hold paradox in a way. And some of it's, I think also the, the difference between discernment and fear, you know, there's nothing wrong with the feces. They just are, you know, yeah. it's when we start becoming frightened of something. Sometimes I, you know, I, when the guides talk about this, they talk about prudence being necessary. You know, prudence is useful. If I live on Maui now, and if there's a sign that says no swimming sharks, probably best not to get into the water. <laughs> right, I want to right. find out the hard way. Um, you know, but it's the same kind of thing. So I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So I have a I have a question. You know, if the guides are available and and want to answer this, and uh, <clears throat> what I've experienced in what I've experienced in my own connection, in my own contact, is that there's a force that I call the, the opponent or the anti-me. And mm -hmm. it's, it's a force that actually is, for my benefit, actually created by me, by, by source, and actually works as kind of the, the competition to refine and allow me to evolve. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've seen this force, and I've felt this force. However, this force plays the game so ruthlessly that it's and 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 I would want it to actually from a higher purview so I've begun to appreciate it but uh I would love to just hear if the guides had any perspective about the the nature of this this antithetical force that I do believe is for our own good in the end but it becomes in as this inner resistance this mm -hmm. inner saboteur and underminer mm -hmm. I'm going to turn into you for this, if I can, because yeah, this please. is specific to you. I don't know that it's a universal experience, and it may well be. So I'm going to see when I get when I get you. All right, great. It's interesting because when I tune into you, the first part of you that comes through says, "says I don't want to be the one who's wrong," and then you become very observant, very observant about how things are calibrated in terms of their relationship to you. They're saying this is not an aspect of you. This is an idea that you carry that is indeed universal. They're saying it's not antithetical to your growth. It's in support of your growth. But it's, it is the aspect of you that calibrates. They're saying the efficiency of, ch of change. It works, I hear, with the soul, of the soul, mm. but, it's not so, but it's not the soul. So in some ways, I've never heard this before, there's some ways this is like a mechanism that you utilize for progression. Mm. So if this is the image. So imagine you're running on a track, and on the sides of the track, there are these little razor blades sticking out, you know, and you bump into them and you're cut, and it moves you back into the forward motion and actually doesn't allow yeah. you to impale yourself on them because you'll be repelled by them. So I hear it's useful, but they're also saying there are other ways to learn. I hear while you may use this for a while, I hear it will bear witness to pain. Mm. But pain, pain is one teacher and not the only one. 
important. They're also saying, if you wish a different teacher, ask for one. Come, come. <laughs> Very well said. Very well said. Yeah, it's, uh, I think I have in my own, in my own constitution, I love competition. You know, I've become a I've become a good basketball player because I've competed against good basketball players. I've uh -huh. become, you know, a good kendo practitioner because I've competed against good kendo practitioners, right? Like this idea of going to the dojo. So I think it is something that actually, if I zoom out of the of the, you know, the immediate conflict and zoom out, I think in some ways I do. I, I have, I do want this and I do like this. And, and then also I want to be able to transcend it as well, you know, and find, and find the teacher of love, you know, like the teacher of the teacher of the risen Christ who sees no, sees no opposition because he knows there is no opposition because he knows all his self. And there's like a transcendent state of learning. And, uh, and I guess if I had my, my wish, it would be to experience both, but have the freedom to actually know when I can, I can learn from the energy of the risen Christ. Well, they say it's useful until you say it's not, you know, <laughs> that's really the gist of it, you know, and the risen Christ, even, you know, it, it, the idea of there, there being an aspect of, of ourselves, which they call the true self or the monad or the Christ within or without, it's not a religious thing. You know, it's yeah. the universal principle. The Christ is a principle that seeks resurrection through us. And that's the essence of the entirety of their teaching, that it can and will be done. It has been done. It will be done. And as and through each of us, you know, when they say this again and again, you know, you, you can't be this without claiming everybody else within it, too. It's the big challenge of the teaching. You know, you can't be the light and, and, and hold of darkness. It's also the slip, one of the slipperiest traps that I've found. Well, there's two slippery traps when it comes to Jesus Christ. And one trap is to place Jesus entirely outside of yourself mm -hmm. and allow no participation in the Christ for yourself. And this uh -huh. is this, Jesus is out there. He died. It's all of us just to serve and be in obeisance yeah. to this, you know, dead being and or that's you know that's god or whatever whatever the whatever the classical fundamental religious beliefs are and not to say that there isn't value in everybody's beliefs and mm -hmm. everybody's on their yeah. own path whatever but i think that that path is not how i understand it. it's not how the guides understand it and then there's the other the other i think challenge that i've seen in some of the spiritual medicine communities it's a challenge of basic inflation where people believe that they're not just the christ participating in the christ but they're jesus they're an actual, the actual reincarnation of Jesus. And somehow that Jesus is different than everybody else's Jesus, you know? And, and so I think there's both of those traps when you start using the word Christ, whereas you and yeah. I can talk about it and, and understand each other perfectly well and actually appreciate that metaphor. And actually I can try to access and call the Christ energy or even Jesus energy if yeah. I'm in a, if I'm in a, in a journey, but but I think those traps are, are dangerous, you know, dangerous kind of traps for people to, that could fall in. They're huge traps. Um, and, I, you know, and there's a, a, when people say I'm hearing, I'm starting to hear my guides. They're telling me I'm here to change the world. And I'm the only one. Every time I hear I'm the only one, I go, uh oh, right. yeah, you know, because totally. it's appealing to the ego. And the teaching the guides bring through is not about the deification of the personality structure. You know, and I think flattery is one of the ways we get trapped in this course, totally. you know, so I'm, I'm very aware of this. When I was doing a workshop, look, I'll give you two, two stories, um, quick ones. Early, I was doing a workshop when I first started doing them and the guides corrected somebody who said, I am the Christ. And the guides said, no, they said, um, they said, you don't become the Christ. The Christ becomes you. <laughs> which is you become the expression of it. It's not about the great I am self yeah. that's going to manifest everything he or she wants and be the best at anything. I don't know that it works that way. I mean, they say it again and again. If you're this, so is everybody else. And the moment you think that you're the only one, you've cut yourself off. Yeah. And that's spiritual pride. And it's it's one of the big pitfalls of sort of the new age and has been since I was first coming into this stuff when I was in my late tw mid twenties, you know, and you'd hear this stuff. And I think it's probably a stage for many people to go through the need to be special, the need to be the one who's got it. And honestly, 
it doesn't work long term. You get stuck. Mm -hmm. And it's a rotten, rotten place to get stuck in. So the other story I was going to tell you quickly was at a workshop. I might have been in Austin or Houston, but there was a guy in the front row who stood up. And the guides were working with this claim, I have come, I have come, I have come, which is they said the, the announcement of the monad as it seeks realization. And this guy in the first row stood up and said, I have come in this big booming voice. And he performed it, you know. And yeah. I'm going, oh, well, that's interesting, because it was a new attunement. I didn't know what it was going to do. And then some older man in the back row raised his hand. He said, you know, my kids gave me your books. And I assume because they heard you, or they was the, the book where you wrote the end. My kids gave me your books, mm -hmm. and now I'm here, and I'm confused about my the church that I've been born into, but I'm this is making sense to me. And the guides had him stand up and do the same attunement. And the energy that came off this guy, it was rolling off of him in waves. The whole room felt it. I felt it. That's when I knew the attunement worked. Right. And it was coming from a place of humility. And it was the action of Source operating through him because that's what Source does. The moment I think I'm the one doing this, I'm screwed. You know, I yeah. understand that I have a skill set, but my job is to show up and allow. That's the, mm. that's the extent of it. And in a lot of ways, I think that's all of our jobs, you know, at this level. Yeah, and, 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 and have the ultimate respect for the unique way that our instrument is shaped, imagining we're a flute and we yeah. have holes a certain way and varnish and we're from a certain tree of our genetic lineage and a certain mind and a certain vocabulary and the, the wind of source blows through the flute and we have a little bit of a little bit of movement we can do with our fingers but the song is coming you know and it's going to sound a little different through us than everybody else but it's the same wind absolutely right yeah so i have another i have another uh, question that came up um from this so this i've experienced that there's this place in which you can step into this kind of um deep spiritual you know kind of connection the upper room you know accessing mm -hmm. the monad and 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 allowing this wisdom to pour forth and whether it's me or somebody else who can step into these moments it's it both it both is you know received with with gratitude in many cases and and also sometimes too much gratitude and, and and then you'll get put on a pedestal and i've also seen that where it's like people get into some kind of worshiping mode which is very scary actually and then there's the other side of that which is attack like attack yeah. comes you know yeah. like you shine the light and the attack comes and i think you you mentioned in uh in resurrection that you know there was many people who've who've come to sh do the most good they've been killed Mm -hmm. right like that's this is a history that we kind of remember yeah. in our lineage is like you shine mm -hmm. your light fully the yeah. spears and the arrows are going to come and so the so i've been in this feeling and it's not just for me it's not a personal thing it's also been a philosophical thing so don't want everybody to think i'm saying oh, i'm being so light i'm being attacked it's this is just kind of a phenomenon that i'm noticing is that the light is getting attacked and when if you allow it to put you into like a war mentality then everything contracts the light doesn't shine as much and it mm -hmm. feels like the minute you go into war mentality the the attackers have won yeah. like that's the that's the trick they're just trying to, if they get you to fight they've actually dimmed your light because you're now armored up like a turtle and Absolutely. you're not actually shining through the through the you know through the fullness yeah. of your heart however there is and the guides also talk about this like there is a a right to self-defense and protection yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So how do you strike the balance between, between allowing yourself to shine with full heart forward and protect yourself when being attacked without corrupting your mentality, right? It's like, that's the paradox of how you show up and call it a rainbow mm -hmm. warrior or call it whatever you want to do, where, you, where you're able to hold both, protect yourself, protect your people, and be in the fullness of your light. I don't know. I mean, I, I have theories, <laughs> maybe, and I have my own experiences with this, and unfortunately, you know, unpleasant ones. Sure. But 
what I believe, I think, at this point is, is you move to a level of resonance. I think the higher you go, the less need for the defense you have. And if I'm not there yet, I need the old defenses. You know, I'm going to need what I require. I mean, I've done everything a human being could do, I think, in my life to dim my light or protect myself, whether it be alcohol, smoking, obesity, all of these things I've done. They've been ways of sort of moving people away. And as I move through these things, as they stop become necessary, it really is a reflection of how much less fear I seem to be holding in my mm -hmm. life. And this old teaching, I think, of turning the other cheek, I think that's what this is about. I don't think you can get hit. And if people are throwing rocks, I suppose the real idea is to rise above it. And that means in consciousness. When I, the first time I ever did um, a, an interview for my work, after the very first book on some you know, cable network in New York. I was very heavy. And the guy who did the interview with me put it in, in like three minute clips up on YouTube with these banner headlines, you know, Paul Selling channeling on ET realities and this big man rocking back and forth. I looked nuts in this thing. <laughs> Nobody knew who I was. And I went, oh crap. And the moment that thing aired, I felt the backlash energetically. Yeah. I just like under, I was like, being covered in crap. And I went to bed and I said to the guides, if you want me to do this work, why are you letting this happen? And their response was, well, as long as you care what people think about you, this is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. So it's my problem still, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's not comfortable. What I've learned in some ways is to care less. That doesn't mean I don't like it. And I don't know. I mean, this whole idea of attack, I think when I was channeling alchemy and I thought I was really going to fall apart during that, I really did. And I didn't. I thought that book should probably be printed with a warning on the cover. Like, if you do this work, you know, you may have to encounter your darkest crap. But on the other side of that was something extraordinary, which is the life I'm living now, mm -hmm. which I would not have gotten because I was so busy being afraid all the time that I didn't know that I could have another life, you know? And I didn't even know that I was that afraid because it was just what I knew and it was my normal. So is there a form? I'm going to ask because it's, 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 a, it's a tricky question. I don't want to almost go yeah. there, but I'm going to ask, is there something that's trying to extinguish the light? Yes, I get yes, but it's Doing it, but I hear it's all of you doing it. You're in a collective fear. You're in a collective fear of who and what you of who and what you truly are. As you try to stamp out the flame, so you try to stamp out the flame before it ignites your life. Before it ignites your life, you can do this. If you wish you can do this if you wish. It will just take more time. It will just take more time. Finally, light. Finally, everybody is the light. Is the light and is recollecting and is recollecting. They're saying recollecting the light and reclaiming it and reclaiming it. And as a pack, they're saying that is a passage humanity under undergoes it's a process as well and it is a process as well but is not necessarily graceful you think you should be grateful that you think it should be graceful is your challenge is your challenge is not graceful it is not graceful exhumation is rarely pleasant exhumation is rarely pleasant you have to look at what you've claimed you have to look at what you've claimed how you've treated others, how you've treated yourself and others and understand those things and understand these things as ways you want something as ways you have known yourself and but not who you truly are. Who you are. When you know who you truly are, this is dismantled. This is dismantled. Not present, not present, and not active in the energetic field, and not active in the energetic field. You're not seeking something. You're not trying or seeking something or seeking something or being your being and your knowing and your knowing and your acting knowing. They're saying, and you are acting from your knowing, period, in their same period. Mm. Is there is there ever a time to fight? To, to fight, to bring yes. the energy to fight. Yes, 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 yes. I hear yes, yes, yes. I mean, what the, the image they're showing me is actually somebody in a cave trying to keep out the flood water, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there's nothing wrong with that level of protection, whether it's, I suppose, a person 
or a flood. I'm assuming this is right. Let me ask, yes and no. They're saying yes and no when you understand source. When you understand source or can realize source at the level we teach or can realize source at the level we teach, there's not credit, there is nothing to protect as you would have it, as you would have it. But because of this, but because the collective doesn't know this, this kind of the collective does the best it can with the methodology it's used, with the methodology it has used, which is action, which is action and defense and defense. When you understand you're one with the brother, when you understand you are one with your brother or sister, with your brother or sister, there is no need to fight. There is no need to fight and no need to protect and no need to protect. You know this. But because you don't know this, you pick up sticks and throw them. You pick up sticks and throw them, period. And they're saying, period. This teaching seems to be encouraging a attitude of non-attachment then to the body, which they talk about is like, this is a primary attachment, right? Is in yeah. order to step into that, to the level that they're requesting, it feels like you have to have almost a non-attachment to the body, a, a Kwang Duke level of, if this is pain, if this is fire, if this is sticks, if this is, then, then I am not afraid because I know I am not my body. But that just seems, seems very, very, very difficult to get there with a body. Yeah. I mean, I'm not there, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I don't, this isn't my story, you know, but I live now on Maui and, and you know, Ram Dass's satsang is nearby and this has become my community. And my friends there cared for this man in the last years of his life. And when they speak about his growth, and I, I don't know what he said about his growth because I, I haven't read enough. You know, they talk about how he really came fully into the teachings that he'd been delivering once the strokes happened, you know, mm -hmm. and that was a big, big shift. So let me go to the question about the body, the idea of the body. The, problem. the idea of the body is the problem. You have a body you have to care for. You're saying you have a body you have to care for. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. If somebody else doesn't need care, if there is somebody else's body that needs care, you support that person in their care. You support that person in their care. You have a body for a reason. You have a body for a reason. It's to be cared for. It is to be cared for and experienced through and experienced through. Now the idea of the body. Now the idea of the body as the only reality, you know, as the only reality you know is part of the problem here, is part of the problem here. You exist in multiple realities. You exist in multiple realities with and without form, with and without form to fear the body, to fear the body or the death of the body or the death of the body while instinctual, while instinctual is its own trap, is its own trap. Eventually you will all die. Eventually you will all die and know the liberation comes when the body is released and know the liberation that comes when the body is released. You will understand the game. You will understand the game or the choice you made or the choice you made to incarnate in form, to incarnate informed or the lesson that form provides, learn the lessons that form provides, but then you know you're not your body, but then you know you are not your body. To protect the body, to protect the body is not only instinctual, is not only instinctual, but a way of caring for the self, but a way of caring for the self. If there is someone trying to kill your body, if there is someone trying to kill your body, best to protect yourself from the killing, best to protect yourself from the killing. If you come to a place in your life, if you come to a place in your life where there is no need for this kind of attack, where there is no need need for this kind of attack or this experience been learned or this experience has been learned you will not incur that act you will not incur that act nor you will need to fight nor will you need to fight period and they're saying period yeah of course that of course that resonates and uh i think one of the challenges is is that every every story every great epic movie it's all the same story and i just watched avatar again and it's family wants peace great yeah. warrior just wants peace but then the enemy comes close and the mm -hmm. great warrior out of love for his family and love for his people reluctantly picks up the weapons that they mm -hmm. that they wished to lay down and we we have this story over and over again and and it's like i can feel i can feel the entrainment of these type yeah. of stories which is basically you can try for peace but the enemy will come and you will, and you will have to fight. So, so like best to vanquish your enemy. It's, it's, it's this whole mindset because like if it's basically saying, if you run from violence, violence will find you. So you mm -hmm. might as well step into this, step into your violence and step into your warrior. And in some ways it's just continuing to entrain this idea that there's no escape from the fight. Yeah. And, and you might as well just, 
you might as well just go into it. And, and that seems like a cultural idea that while sometimes true is also in training a, a set of behaviors that is not ultimately going to get us where we need to go. I mean, I agree. And I also suspect that what we're most frightened of tends to find us in one way or another. And that can be seen as, you know, the attacker, you know, even if it's an internal issue that is being outpictured in one's life. And then again, I think these things become opportunities to encounter or, or reclaim those aspects of ourselves that have been under attack or are put in fear. I don't know. And maybe the best metaphor that we've had has been battle, you know, and war. But I think that there are other ways to to understand that kind of passage. I think there are people that have probably undergone comparable journeys that have never left their house, you know, or even (laughs) their armchair and still had to encounter them. Because I think that's part of the condition, you know, I... When I taught college years for many, for many, many years, you talk about Arist- we talk about Aristotle and the idea of something broaching a status quo. You know, you have the peace in the land, something interrupts the peace in the land, and then you've got to restore it. And the action is usually towards restoration. I think we're at a place now culturally where we don't get to restore the peace in the land that we knew. I think there's something else that seeks to be born now that Mm. isn't a replication of the old and that's the challenge and we want to do that when people sometimes say i am a spiritual warrior i almost go that's like an oxymoron almost to me you know what does Mm. that really mean does it mean you're looking for the for for, i mean the idea that you're going to vanquish darkness by stepping on it i don't know that it works that way i think you vanquish darkness by being the light you know, mm-hmm. by claiming the light where it's been denied. The guides have said again and again and again that the only real challenge humanity faces is what they call the denial of the divine. And what that means is what we put in darkness, who we put in darkness, where we've decided that God or source or whatever that you want to call it cannot be. And because when we do that, we amplify that darkness, we go into alignment with it, and then we end up creating with it and, and really exacerbating it or ex- extending it. So this whole idea that um, it doesn't have to be a battle is a, is a, is a kind of a different paradigm. And I don't yeah. know that it has to, but I think that there are times when it is. You know, there are times when it is. And it would require, I mean, it would require forgiveness of a deep level of forgiveness, uh, a Christ-like level of forgiveness uh, for those who have actually transgressed the, you know, the ethics and morals that are actually, I believe, in some ways, first principles and values about the violation of others' sovereignty, the infliction of pain for your pleasure. Like, there are things that are... You know, and, and it would require a, a forgiveness of that. But in that forgiveness could be a transcendence that would even transcend beyond this punishment model. But it's, again, it's just one of those things that feels so hard. I mean, it, feel, it feels so far from where we are collectively. It's not that I can't see it, but it's just, it's difficult to imagine this, yeah. you know, a, you know, a murderer or a child rapist or something like that. And, and I can imagine this level of forgiveness and seeing all things and also then still can't imagine a, a, a situation where that collectively could actually transpire and he could, he or she could be transformed, you know, mm-hmm. by how we saw them in that. But I, I can, I can see it. It just feels like a distant future, you know, in some ways. I don't know that it has to be. I mean, I think we're accountable to all of our acts. I think that's a given. You know, if, if you break it, you bought it. If you hurt it, you've incurred yeah. the challenge and the, or the, the debt you need to pay for that. Um, in Resurrection, the guides are talking more and more about this idea of redemption and what that really means. And the if, if I decide that someone cannot be redeemed, that they're irredeemable, I basically decided that source cannot express where that person is. And they say, when you deny the divine in another, you deny the divine in yourself. And that is forgiveness. 
You know, I mean, you to be able to say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. You know, and by the way, I was raised an atheist. And even though I've got that painting behind me, you know, I mean, I've got, you know, uh, Hanuman on my desk right in front of me and the booze sure. over there. So there's a lot of there's a lot of folks around. And yeah, yeah. But I understand this. And, you know, when the guides teach forgiveness, sometimes they start off easy and they say, you have to forgive this person for not being who you want or wanted them to be. Because that's the terrible betrayal, you know, that somebody is mm. doing what we think they shouldn't or can't. And in fact, they've done it. But, you know, in my old 12-step days for way back when, you know, they used to say to me before I knew any of this stuff, people would say, you know, you got to look for the good or the God in everyone. And it's easy to look for the good or the God in somebody that you agree with or like. It's much more challenging. And there's much, much more growth attached to being able to do that with the one that you never want to see again. Yeah. Is there, is there a sense from the guides that things are getting, because what, what it appears that things are getting more polarized. We're pulling apart from each other in many, in many ways. And that this is part of a necessary step to exaggerate things to the point where the folly is revealed. And then once the folly is revealed, there can be a coming together. Well, they're saying yes, but I think there may be more to it. Yes, yes, yes. They're saying yes, yes, yes. It's a choice you're making. And they're saying it's a choice you are making to disable one another, to disable one another when you see the futility of it. When you see the futility of it, perhaps you'll change your minds. Perhaps hmm. you will change your mind. The ideology we teach, the ideology we teach is also present, is also present in every choice you make and every choice you make because an aspect of all of you, because there is an aspect of all of you agree with this or not, agree with this or not, but in fact knows who he or she is, but in fact knows who he or she is and realizes the foolishness and realizes the foolishness of one's actions, of one's actions in contrary nature, in contrary nature to one's divinity, to one's divinity or all awakening to you are all awakening to your true natures, to your true natures. It's not an easy awakening. It is not an easy awakening because those of you wish to remain asleep, because those of you who wish to remain asleep are frightened of what would happen if they woke up, or frightened of what would happen if they woke up, will do their best to stay where they are, will do their best to stay where they are. This is not wrong-minded. This is not wrong-minded as much as, we fear, as, much as an agreement to fear. If he would invite you to stay where you are in your pain, Fear would invite you to stay where you are in your pain, deny the divine in another, deny the divine in another and yourself as well, and yourself as well, because if you forget who you are, because if you forget who you are, you're not accountable to the promise, you are not accountable to the promise, the great promise, the great promise of realization, of realization, to realize is to know, to realize is to know, and to know who you are in truth, and to know who you are in truth, is to know who all are, is in fact to know who all are. So that's that. Can I just ask quickly about the times we're in as it relates sure. to that? Yeah, please. Like, the idea of who you are is actually being reflected in opposition is actually being reflected in opposition because you mandate and support it, because you mandate and support it when you stop mandating and supporting yourselves. When you stop mandating it and supporting it within yourselves, you're your brothers, you will stop doing it to your brothers, period, period, period. So... Mm. Yeah. And what I've heard for a while is that this is just change, big, big, big change and productive, yeah. just not comfortable. Yeah. When, when, uh, <clears throat> the guides referred to something in resurrection where they said they're giving teachings at higher levels now than they used to back in the beginning because the students, you know, mm-hmm. and presumably they're speaking to students who have raised their collective awareness of the teachings themselves. And so they're able to give higher teachings. It's not like the guy, maybe the guides are learning, you know, in some way, but it seems like they kind of, they kind of know the, they, they know what they know in, in a big way, but they're escalating people in their teaching. Yeah. And, and this is a curious, it, it comes to a curious question about strategy, right? Mm-hmm. Because in some ways you could call that strategy where they're saying, well, we're actually, we're giving you what you're able to learn when you're able to learn it. We're telling you the truth at the level that you can accept the truth and they're mm-hmm. being, you know, strategic in that kind of way. And, and there's, and there's that question about truth is like some truths would be very inflammatory if you went out and said mm-hmm. them, but there's, mm-hmm. so I'm always wondering, like, do you just say the truth, just say the truth as it is plainly, or how much space is there for the strategy to kind of make the truth a little gentler, try to escalate people a bit more. And it's this kind of, 
interesting back and forth battle within my own mind, not necessarily battle, but a decision within my own mind of like, all right, full truth or back off it a little bit to maybe get more people along the way. And it, it seems like the guides are doing that in, in some small way, at least as well. I'd say, I mean, I've never thought about that. Let me, but I, I have an opinion about a little of it. So the very first book was dictated in, through me in 2009, published in 2010, and there's now 11, 10 are in print. I think the 11th will be out soon, and I know that there's another after that. And after that, I don't know. But the very first book, I Am the Word, I think holds the DNA of all of their teachings. I think they've been unpacking it since then mm. at the level that we can hold it. Now, this isn't about intellectual holding. It's not about the information. The information is challenging, certainly, and it's sort of mind-blowing in a lot of ways for me still, because I still want to interrupt it and question it and contest a fair amount of what they say. But the teachings are really energetic transmissions that work with the readers, you know, and it's always been that way. And the attunements escalate in terms of what we can manage and hold. So it's a little bit along the lines, in my experience, that you don't want to bring somebody into too bright a room too quickly or they're going to run from the light or they're going to go blind right, or they're going right, to go crazy. Right. You want to bring them at the level that they can move into vibrational accord with the teaching. And the idea of, you know, a, a truth, truth is truth. And the guides have said many times, what is true is always true. Truth is not subjective. We live in a world now where people say, my truth is, and I'll say my truth is once in a while, which is basically saying my belief, my experience, my understanding. But I think what is true is always true. I could say I'm in a male body now, but is that always true? I don't think so. You know, mm -hmm. I think I probably will be in some other kind of body at some other point because I believe right. that we progress. So it's always true in this lifetime that this is what I'm in at this moment, at least, unless I change that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's always true. So the challenge with truth telling is that it's often born, I think, from a subjective sense of right and wrong or self-righteousness. And the guides have said many, many, many times, and I don't like this teaching, but it's true. Self-righteousness is always the small self, and the small self is the personality structure, that's all. It's not a bad thing. We all have it, you know. But whenever I'm up on my high horse wanting to say this is the way it is, I'm usually, I may be accurate, but I'm usually sort of operating from a sense of needing to make others wrong. And if I need to be right at the cost of somebody else being wrong, I think I may have a bit mm. more of a challenge. So um, I'm going to ask about telling the truth and how to say it, because you've asked if, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, please. So they're saying you can say what you wish. No, your intent behind what you say. No, your intent behind what you say. You're seeking to illumine. If you're seeking to illumine, to support, to support, to heal, to heal, or to teach, or to teach, say what you wish. Say what you wish. If you're willing to deny, if you're seeking to deny, to destruct, to destruct, or to battle, or to battle, you might want to think again. You might want to think <laughs> again. There may be a higher way to express. <laughs> that's a that's a really very clear distinction i appreciate that thank you thank you guides for that uh so as i'm listening so let's and one of the things they talk about too is divine flow and this idea of basically listening and there's another passage that's there's some passages about divine flow but then they also talk about the heart and they say your heart will not lie to you because the divine yeah. as you at the level of the heart can translate any experience to its implicit truth so they're giving a teaching that when you're listening to the heart, it's akin to like a divine flow where you're guided mm -hmm. by by wisdom that's coming through. <clears throat> this is this is one of the places where often I feel like I can hear it, but also where there's certain times where I can I have difficulty distinguishing between the voice of my heart and the trickster, a trickster yeah. voice in my own mind, mm -hmm. or another, or maybe the small self's voice impersonating mm -hmm. the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you or they have any guidance for how to distinguish between the voice of the heart and yeah. sometimes it's clear, but and the voice of the heart and the voice of the mind or small self or the trickster, whatever you want to call it. And and what are some like practical ways that if you find yourself a little bit lost in a fog where things aren't so clear because emotions may be strong or mm -hmm. you're in you're in and it's it's hard to hear that clear 
you know, clear strident sound of the heart. Mm -hmm. What are some practical ways to get back, get back to listening? Well, I mean, there's a simple, I don't know if we've done this before, but you know, the guides say the true self knows the small self thinks, and there's nothing wrong with thinking, you know, um, I don't know how to bake a pie. I'm gonna have to look at the directions to bake a pie. Right. I don't right. know yet. But they say when you're in your knowing and they say to know something is to realize it. And they say it's the divine within you that knows through you, that aspect of you that is in its knowing is the true self. When you're actually in your knowing or you're listening to your heart, there is never a question. There's no question. There's <laughs> to contest. It's really that simple. If I were to say, you go to a time in your life, this is what they do in classes, go to a time in your life when you knew something. I knew I was in love. I knew this was the right job. I knew the relationship was over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you go to that, remember what it feels like in the body. Yeah. Now go to what you think. I think I know what I'm having for dinner tomorrow night. I think I know how long I'm going to live. I think I know the results of the next election. Mm. And see the difference because there's always a question attached. Yeah. You know, I think when we want to convince ourselves of something, that's when it gets challenging. I wonder sometimes if I truly moved into my knowing, if I really operated from there as a human being, would I even need to channel? I don't think so, because true knowing is clear cognizance. Mm. And that's the gift of knowing. It's, a, it's a, an amazing thing, but that's what the guides are teaching us. Well, how, what's the passage though? What's the passage between when things, because I know what, I know that feeling and I love that yeah. feeling. I love being there. And actually for an extended period of time at Burning Man Festival, I was able to actually, for the longest stretch I've ever been able to not toggle down, feel, yeah. you know, from my own perception, not toggle down into my small self for like six uh -huh. days. Wow. I was just clear. I knew where we were going. When I had the bicycle, I knew exactly which direction to go. I knew like what, what thing I could say that would bring the most laughter and what like energy was just flowing out. It was a beautiful experience. And so things were very clear in that. And, uh, and, and, you know, all gratitude to Burning Man and the collective and the freedoms and, and the medicines and all the things that contributed to that. So things were very clear. And I understand, I feel, I know that, I know that, that, I know that sense of clarity. And then I also know when it's like, I just can't, I can't feel the truth anymore in my body and things are confusing. And yeah. I think I hear a voice and then I hear another voice. And then it's like, what, what do you do in those situations? A decision has to be made. You don't feel it in your body. You yeah. know, like, like what's, what do we do at that, at that point, you know, and, and my own method is just tr keep trying to listen and then eventually just choose something. But I'm wondering if you or the guides have any insight is like, all right, how do we get back to that feeling? Like I had at Burning Man where I just, I knew when things are confusing. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to you first and see what happened okay. at Burning Man because that might be helpful. Right. And then we'll see about returning to it. When I go to you at Burning Man, you say, I was I was not trying, I was being. Hmm. And then you go, huh? I was just being. And then it was easy. And so you know, there's nothing to prove. Um, let me go to what restores this. The idea of who you are is what's at stake here with the small self. When the small self presents your personality structure has an idea, has an idea of what should be, of what should be, it will seek to impose it. It will seek to impose it and surpass knowing and surpass knowing to get what its needs are, to get what its needs are when you operate from knowing. When you operate from knowing, you have to be willing to surrender the idea of what you should have. You have to be willing to surrender the idea of what you should have because what will be granted will be perfect because what will be granted to you will be perfect. So how do you get back there by trust? By trust and allowance and allowance. You can't make yourself know. You can't make yourself know, but you can align to the aspect of you that knows, but you can align to the mm -hmm. aspect of you that knows. And that aspect is always present. And that aspect of you is always present. I want to give you one more. It will not give you what you want when you want it. That is the small self demanding to know. That is the small self demanding to know, but it is available. But it is available if you align to it. And if you align to it, you'll be able to ride the storm. You will be able to ride the storm until the answer becomes clear, until the answer becomes clear, period. They're saying period. Mm, fuck. That's it. It's like, it's actually, it's actually in those moments, it's not that I can't figure it out. It's that I've forgotten who I am and how to be and who I be, yeah. really. Yeah. And so yeah. actually the answer, like the way forward is to restore, because at, at Burning Man, I didn't doubt who I was. I, I knew it. I was being, I was being me. 
the whole time. And that was the, that's what made it easy is like, I knew the divine and me working together my unique flute and the wind working Mm -hmm. together. Like we just knew what song to play and where to go. And so then it becomes a question of more just restoring, restoring my gnosis of who I am, which actually is, you know, one of your very first and most classic affirmations. I know who I am. I know what I am. I know how I serve in truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am here, I am here, I am here. I mean, it, it seems like in those moments, really going through this, these affirmations of, a reminder of who I really am seems like a, a great strategy to go to. And I guess, so that, that seems like it makes a lot of sense. And then I, I'm curious, I have like, I have, you know, names, which are just basically ideas of, if I was to say, I know who I am, I know what I am. I know how I serve. I am here. Well, what do you, well, what's your name? And I've made names, you know, uh-huh. I've made a, I've made a name for that. And so I'm curious if that, if that, uh, if that can be a productive, if that can be productive, of course, I, you know, it seems productive to me to use that. I hear it's useful, but I'm hearing it almost like they're weighing it. Like, oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> so let me go. It's useful only at the level that you can utilize and decide that your name is Percy. If you decide that your name is Percy and Percy delivers, and Percy deserves all good things, you have to be clear. You have to be clear that what Percy thinks is best, that what Percy thinks is best, what not because it might not be what's best. You're creating an aspect of self. You're creating an aspect of self that is well deserved, but is while deservable, expects to get expects to get what he expects. The claim I know who I am. The claim I know who I am is the claim of the monad, is the claim of the monad or the divine self or the divine self, the essence or truth of your, the essence or truth of who you are. It is actually nameless. It is actually nameless. It is eternal. It is eternal. It was never born, will never die. Was never born, will never die. It is the creator as you. It is the creator as you come through you, come through you, seeking its expression as and by you, seeking its expression as and by. To say, I know who I am. To say, I know who I am as the unknown, as the unknown, or as the perfect being, or as the perfect being would be useful, perhaps, would be useful, perhaps, as long as you don't give it qualities. As long as you don't give it qualities, are being endowed that are being endowed at the level of structure at the level and structure of personality that's a great false god that is how you create a false god my god says this my god says this her god says that her god says that finally we would have to say finally we would have to say while well, individuated experience while well, individuated experience of source of source will vary greatly will vary greatly there is one source there is one source being called many things being called many things and known by many false names and known by many false names the one true source the one true source you can call it i am if you wish you can call it i am if you wish or god if you prefer or god if you prefer is always present is always present regardless of what it's called regardless of what it is called if your intent is to know God through the claim, if your intent is to know God through the claim, name it as you wish, name it as you wish. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it, that all makes, that all makes sense. And, and I guess what it feels like to me is that I'm, I'm offering a name to the flute and mm-hmm. not trying to name the wind, allowing the wind to be nameless, but giving the flute a name that's different from my, from my usual name, which is a really, frankly, associated with a lot of toggling up and yeah. down. The Aubrey is a lot. And this name is like, no, this is my flute when the wind is blowing through it. I hear useful, useful, useful. Yeah. You know, useful. I mean, they cool. call it the monad. So that's a name too, you know? Right. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this, this journey is, is, uh, <laughs> What are, what are, I mean, I'm sure you get this question a lot, you know, and I think the answer is simply to, to embody it, but there's a lot of people who are listening, a lot of people who come to our fit for service events and they have a spouse or a partner. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure you get this a bunch. Like, I really want my husband to come, or I really want my wife to come, you know, and experience this. Is there anything else that we can do besides just embody the teachings to the best, to the best of our ability? Well, I mean, I hear in relationship to the partners, I mean, the guys just said, know who they are in truth, you know, beyond your prescription for them. You no. know, very often when somebody says, you know, I'm on this great spiritual path and my partner doesn't agree with this. And I mean, while there's growth, there's also at times uh, somebody who's in a spiritual process who's presupposing 
what's right for somebody else or best for somebody else. And they can't mm -hmm. know that. I don't know that. You know, my yeah, mother has yeah. had, a, my mother was basically, I didn't know this until the last couple of years ago, you know, on her 18th birthday, she was, you know, assaulted by her minister, you know, who she'd been wow. sent to live with after her relatives died. I didn't know that. And so I live with, my, my mother can't read the books, you know, she just can't go there. She wishes she could. And she says she can't, it's too hard for yeah. her. And yeah. I can respect that. But I also know that, you know, that's not how I, I can't, I'm not going to give her, I'm not going to give her this. I can love her as she is, which is its mm. own challenge, truthfully, you know, yeah. in some days. So and that is the, and that is the embodiment of the teaching really actually is to just love them exactly as they yeah. are and that yeah. love and, and seeing them, seeing them as they actually are, then that is actually transforms them and actually opens the door for the transformation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, that's that's a good reminder from from older books that uh, that I is just now coming back to me for sure. Uh, I just glanced down at my notes, and it's not exactly uh, it's a little non sequitur from where we were, but there's this really provocative idea. Um, so okay, this is what you say here, and I'm just going to read it so we can we can get into it. And I think I cut a few pieces out of the middle, so it's not um, so sequential. The template of the old reality with its destinations of good and evil, heaven and hell are problematic now. The idea of hell that you've been given, the absence of God, a place of fire and brimstone, a place of torture is also metaphor. You understand that fire burns away the old and the burning of the dross, the release of the old is part of the, par is part of the practice we claim in our teachings. There is not a geographical location for hell Hell becomes an idea of the absence of God. So the really provocative aspect of that, of course, there's several, but the one that I really appreciated and something that I actually contemplated as well because of this show that I watched that had a depiction of hell. Uh, I think it was some show about a Sandman. Anybody, do you know, remember what that show was, Derek? It's, it's just called Sandman. But anyways, I, at, during watching that show, I saw the hell is, a, they had different metaphors of hell, but this idea that this is actually the fire, it's a fire of alchemy that you go through and that which burns is not yourself, is not your true self. And so you move through almost like the path to recognizing your divinity is a path that takes you through hell, the burning mm -hmm. away of yeah. all of these aspects of identity, all of the dross, as the guides say, to yeah. allow yourself to emerge. It's also the myth of the phoenix, which comes in fire. And yeah. the more you're attached to the identity structures that burn and the small self that burns and these, these features that burn, the more painful hell is and the more torture there becomes. But it's actually a crossing, you know, and yeah. it's actually like an alchemical crossing. And this is the mm -hmm. metaphor that we all missed <laughs> in, oh. the, in, the, in the interpretations. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that's what they're saying. Um, I don't know that there's anything to add to it. I think you explained it well. I think some of what I understand is that we, go, we can go through some of this stuff while we're in form. We just have to be willing to, you know, and yeah. how we deal with it later. In the, in the show, Sandman, uh, everybody was carrying their own fire. And wow. I thought that was also a provocative That's telling really of the myth where yeah. it's like they were, they were, there was no fire other than the fire they were carrying, which was the, the idea that that thing needed to burn and be painful yeah. in that way. And actually, if they could set down their fire, they would no longer be in hell, you know, yeah. in a way was, they didn't say that explicitly, but that image of carrying your own fire into hell with you. Yeah was like, and that's why you're there, is because your, your own shame and your own reproach and your own denial and abnegation of self was your own hell that you're carrying yeah. with you. And so like all of us are carrying a little bit of our hell, a little bit yeah. of hell with us and then trying to go to in, step into the kingdom carrying hell in a backpack full of fire, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at least we're trying to go to the kingdom, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Good news. And, um, you know, when you were speaking, the guys were piping in the background and they were their 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 commentary was what you came to learn. So mm. we come to learn these things, you know. I I'm in this really interesting place right now where I look at my life five years ago, even, and I don't recognize myself in a lot of ways. And I don't realize how I lived when I look back and it was fine, but it's not now, 
And it's very interesting. It's a very interesting phenomena or experience of being that's where, I, where I'm not, I don't seem to be operating with the same filters that used to tell me who I was or how I should be or what was wrong. And I'm not saying I'm enlightened because I'm not, but I'm learning that it doesn't have to be what I thought it was. And God knows, I probably carried a whole bunch of fire in my backpack, you mm -hmm. know, because it wasn't pleasant much of it, but really useful, I have to say. And I really, you know, when the guides say, you know, everything that we encounter, we have an opportunity to learn through. I think that that's very true. You know, you don't get to be a victim and a master at the same time, they said. So that's really how mm -hmm. we choose to, to understand ourselves and our experience. It seems like the celebration of victimhood has become stronger in the in the cultural zeitgeist in a certain way. It's like it's a competition. It's it's uh, my a podcast guest recently, Mark Gover, called it the Victim Olympics. You mm -hmm. know, where we're all competing to be the the most victim, and I think mm -hmm. that comes from a fear of judgment ultimately, because in the victim we can we can give up our power. And yeah. claim that we're powerless, and so we have no responsibility. And if we have no responsibility, we can't fuck it up. You know, is yeah. is that is that the, is that the connection that you or the guides see? Is is this is this reason that we want to be the victim because we're afraid of this j idea of judgment and this idea of responsibility? No, I hear you don't want to know how powerful you are. That's too frightening mm -hmm. to know how powerful you are. I mean, it's a hard one for me. You know, I was, you know. I, you know, I was a bullied kid. I have a lot of experience with this, and I, I understand it up at a level. But I also, on, on, on a personal level, know what a trap it is for me and why I choose not to to go there. You know, I, I may visit there briefly, but it, I, I don't let it last. Let me ask about the cultural moment, because I, I never have. Yeah. I hear it's actually a way of self-identification. It's not that's not useful, but necessary, but necessary for you to move beyond for you to move beyond it. You know, so, so in some ways it's a bit of a pendulum swing, you know? Um it will pass and this will pass. You're actually realizing what autonomy is. You're actually realizing what autonomy is, what autonomy is, and how the will can be utilized in high ways, and how the will can be utilized in high ways or in high ways to understand high ways. You will have an encounter with the lower, you will have an encounter with the lower and learn from those things as well, and learn from those things as well. Mm. Is I also get the sense that there it feels to me like there's periods in which the universe is really flowing with me, wind at my back. And then there's periods where there's wind in my face. And I don't yeah. know if this is me creating a story from actually, you know, rant circumstantial events that I link together and say, ah, this mm -hmm. is a season where I'm out of alignment with the universe or there's some, I mean, you could look at it from an astrological perspective, which I don't prefer that perspective. And people will yeah. say that, ah, oh, Mar Mars is in retrograde yeah. right now. And but what is what is the kind of the the sense from the guides or yourself about are there are there seasons where things kind of externally are, are harder and seasons where things in you know externally are easier? Yes, I get yes. In some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. But it depends on what you're aligned to and how the common field is going and how the common field is working. The common field is what you utilize. The common field is what you utilize you know, your to know your own experience. You think it's just you. You think it's just you, but you're actually participatory, but you are actually participatory to a much larger energy, to a much larger energetic landscape. Now to lift to the upper room. Now to lift to the upper room will support you in beyond, beyond and will support you in being beyond that, beyond that fray, if you wish, but you cannot ignore it. But you cannot ignore ignore it. It's not about denying it. It's not about denying it when one has the experience. When one has the experience of the wind blowing their sails, of the wind blowing their sails, one is unobstructed, one is unobstructed. When you feel the wind, when you feel the wind in your face, in your face, you are being invited to release obstruction. You are being invited to release obstruction. This is true at the collective mm. level. This is true at the collective level, which is where you all stand now, which is where you all stand now and the individual and the individual who's experiencing this all who is experiencing it as a solitary win period and they're saying period. Mm. Is there an image that I got, which was the the idea of being on a ship? It's a sail, it's a sailboat that also has oars. And mm -hmm. certain times it feels like you can just put the sail up and the wind is going to move you and you can actually take your hands off the oars. Yeah. And and there's also times where the wind 
from this collect the collective agreements, et cetera, are blowing towards the sale. So it's actually best to pull the sale in and mm-hmm. still continue like a salmon upstream. And it might just require a little bit more sweat and yeah. the oars. And just understand that sometimes you have to row and sometimes yeah. the wind is gonna be is gonna be with you. Yep. Yeah. Chop wood, carry water. It's the basic stuff. You take care of the basic stuff when that's what's happening. And that's how I deal with it as best I can. I do what's in front of me. You know, and then it changes. It always does. You know, I don't know that it's ever the same or is ever supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you and the guides wouldn't mind, if there's any way that um, that you can tap into just me personally sure. and trusting that lessons for me are also valuable lessons for the collective about, you know, any guidance for this place that I'm at in my path and and what I'm, you know, what I'm currently experiencing, if they have any, any guidance, or if I, I need to be more specific, I can, but just any general guidance for me at this point. I'll just tune into you first as you, and that's more yeah. psychic, and then the guides may come through. Great. You're coming through saying, I don't know what I want anymore. And that's terrifying to me. And I'm supposed to be in charge. And what happens if I don't know? I hear everything makes sense once you agree that you don't know, then true knowing then true knowing can come. But when you're pretending to know or trying to figure it out, you're doing an exercise, you're doing an exercise. When you say, I don't know, when you say, I don't know, nor do I know how to know, nor do I know how to know, the knowing may be present, the knowing may be present. In some ways, the well of knowing. In some ways, the well of knowing, which has been ignored by you, which has been ignored by you in certain areas, so in certain areas of your life is actually being filled, is actually being filled for you to work with, for you to work with effectively, effectively, to trust yourself through these times, to trust yourself through these times, to trust by screen union, is to trust the process you are engaging in, to doubt the true self, to doubt the true self, which you may do if you wish, which you may do if you wish, will only claim you in temporary stasis, will only claim you in a temporary stasis because what you've already incurred because what you have already incurred by way of action and movement by way of action and movement at this level at this level will not be quieted will not be quiet in the long term in the long term so we get a bump in the road so when you hit a bump in the road as we say as we say those things are useful these things are useful they dislodge the baggage that accrued in the back seat they dislodge the baggage that the baggage has been accrued in the back seat in your case we suggest in your case, we suggest prayer is useful. Prayer is useful. And by prayer, we mean communion. And by prayer, we simply mean communion. Go to the heart. Go to the heart. Allow the heart to sing and teach you. And allow the heart to teach you and sing to you and sing to you its own song. Its own song. Its own song will never lie. Its own song will never lie and create a plane and create a plane of expression, of expression for you to carry yourself through, for you to carry yourself through lovely lovely and kind and kind period period and they're saying period hmm. <laughs> do you have anything specific you want to know about <sighs> yeah that really you know that really lands and uh and resonates deeply um let me see if there's anything more specific that i want to that i want to talk about i guess the i guess what I struggle with is the what I perceive is a is a conflict between my desire to continue the evolution of my being and mm-hmm. my desire to produce and do mm-hmm. during this time as well. And the mm-hmm. balance between focusing on my being and the balance between, you know, doing and being of service, showing up in a way that can be of service, mm-hmm. both to myself, you know, I can't ignore that, and also mm-hmm. to, you know, to the world. But what, what I hear is they're not contradictory. It's, about how they look. it's simply about how they look and the authority you prescribe to one thing or another and the authority that you prescribe to one thing or another with the man I am. Who the man I am should show up as, should show up as, is still the egoic structure, is still the egoic structure, prescribing action, prescribing action. When you listen to the result, when you listen to the true self, which is a quieter voice, yes, which is a quieter voice, yes, it may carry you to a direction. It may carry you to a new direction, but you will not be faulted for it, but you will not be faulted for it. The idea of a contemplative life, the idea of a contemplative, a contemplative life, which is actually quieting, which is actually quieting the industry, the industry or the product or the product that you engage with that you engage with is useful to a point 
-hmm. is useful to a point, but this does not negate product, but this does not negate product or action in the world or action in the world, to be in the world, but not of it, to be in the world, but not of it has always been this teaching, has always been this teaching, if you're feeling compelled, if you are feeling compelled to be quiet, to be quiet, honor the compulsion, honor the compulsion or the desire or the desire when you're called to act, when you are called to act, there can also be no question, there can also be no question, the true self knows, the true self knows and will claim you and will claim you in its agreement with will, in its agreement with will, when you align higher will, when you align higher will, the true self as will, the true self as will with your expression, with your expression, you move with grace, you move with grace, period, and they're saying period. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that I've felt is that there's certain times where I'm more compelled to do. And an, a lot of those times, it's times where I have less faith that there are there's support and that there's yeah. guidance and that there's help that's coming from multiple different places. And I start to take this onus, this burden, this weight more on my shoulders than is necessary, mm -hmm. I think. And, and so... Yeah. I think for me, it's about like when I can really have faith and I recently got a, you know, just got a message that the voice came through and said like, like, don't worry, we got this. Like we yeah. got this, like, it's all like, we got this, we're going through and mm -hmm. we're all in this together and we got this. And it was, it's just mm -hmm. this beautiful sense that actually the God that is everywhere and in everything through me and beyond me is actually, is actually moving, move, we're all moving together. And it's not mm -hmm. about making, you know, this lone ranger making a stand as, as the individual, it's about this collective instead of ego, it's like, we go, you know, like we, we go, we go mm -hmm. together. And, and those, those are the times where everything feels like it balances out or when I place the burden on my own shoulders, it feels like I actually carry too much weight and I get burned out. Well, what I was hearing when you were speaking was it's what you're used to. So that's why yeah, yeah. Doing, it's just what you're used to that can be changed. It's easy actually here. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess the final thing is, you know, it seems like for you, your journey of being able to actually embody the work seems to be also you're in an evolution where it's getting easier for you to actually not only transmit it, but actually to live it, to be it. Is that uh would that be fair to say? It's how it feels today. Ask me in a week. You know, um, <laughs> it's how it feels now. I feel very <laughs> grateful, really, 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 really grateful most of the time, and um, and very surprised because what I'm experiencing now isn't something that I knew I could. You know, I just didn't know that I could. I thought maybe yeah. this was supposed to be something other, and yeah. that's really interesting for me. And, um, you know, so that's where it is today. It's all I know. <laughs> well, I just want to say as, as your friend, and, uh, I'm really happy to hear that. And, you know, I, I really deeply love not only the work and the guides and everything that comes through you, but you as a human and just have the utmost gratitude to both. And as they're the same and as they're different, just, you know, really the utmost gratitude on behalf of myself and, also on behalf of the world that uh, that this work continues and that this work is actually moving through your own life paul's life in a, in a way that's bringing more beauty and joy to uh to your life thank you so much i love you too yeah <laughs> thank you for today this is really really special and uh yeah i look forward to getting the the next book on innocence and yeah. uh, and i'm I, I really see that that second innocence coming. You know, it's not the not the first naivety innocence. It's the second innocence of yeah. having gone through the challenges and moving through the periods of separation and arriving at that second innocence. So, I can't wait to see what the what those teachings have in store. Happy to share them. Yeah, so much love, love you, Paul. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That's a wrap. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.